Two weeks from tonight at this time, the American album of familiar music returns to the air, bringing you the finest of light classical music. Styled in the popular manner, the American album of familiar music has been preferred listening for many, many years. It's tops for refreshing Sunday evening entertainment. Your favorite soloists return with the orchestra on the American album of familiar music, Sunday, August 27th, over most of these NBC stations. And now, Top Secret. This story is Top Secret. Top Secret. Exciting stories of intrigue and espionage brought to you transcribed by NBC. And starring Ilona Massey as the Baroness Karen Gazer, a woman who fought without protection, without recognition, and without fear for the forces of freedom. Tonight, as Assignment 10, The Case of the Tattooed Pigeon. Assignment 10 began and ended with tragedy. I had been assigned by Central Intelligence to trace leaks of important top secret information from the Department of Internal Security in London to German intelligence in Berlin. A dozen other operators were working on the case with me, but in spite of tremendous effort, we had uncovered nothing. And then one Tuesday, I got an invitation. An invitation from Sir Roger Fenfield, Chief of Britain's Department of Internal Security. Hello? Karen, it's Roger Fenfield. Yes, Roger. Karen, I have bad news. Horribly bad news. Leslie Howard has been killed in a plane crash. Oh, Roger, no. Yes, an hour ago. Was the leak from your department? Karen, I don't know. I just don't know. Well, is there anything I can do? I have a country place at Spurnhead. Can you come for the weekend? Yes, yes, of course. The situation has become so desperate, I've decided to call in Everett Rowan. Everett Rowan. For months, I had heard of this fabulous American. Ostensibly, he worked for a New York firm in London. Few people knew that he was one of Washington's most trusted agents, one of America's top spies. The train for Spurn had left London at noon on Friday. Everett Rowan and I got a first-class compartment to ourselves. Sabotage at Croydon, the affair at Birmingham, the blueprints of the Spitfire, the sinking of the Athenia, and now Leslie Howard's death. Eight vital leaks in the last four months. All from Sir Roger Fenfield's department? Yes. But many people knew that Mr. Howard was making this trip. Only the pilot and Roger Fenfield knew the route the plane was to take. I see. Tell me, what goes on at Spurn Head? It's Roger's country home. The very inside heart of the department has been moved up there. Much of a staff? An aide named Captain McLeod and a secretary, uh, Miss Ains. And a cook named Molly. How do you know? I asked to see their records too, Baroness, before you requisitioned them and put them in your little black briefcase. Then you know about Molly? I know that she's a cook. And harmless. There were two pages in her dossier, quite routine information. The last page is missing. I'd like to know why. Our job, Mr. Rowan, is to discover how vital British secrets are getting to the enemy, not to persecute house servants. Baroness, I know this business as well as you do. Roger Fenfield stole a page from the dossier internal security had on his cook. I want to know why. Perhaps you'll find out this weekend. Perhaps. Uh, Baroness. Yes, Mr. Rowan? Have you ever heard the expression, the oldest game in the world? Well, well I, I don't quite know what you mean. The real criminal calls in the police to throw suspicion elsewhere. Sir Roger Fanfield is one of the most respected men in England. He's had a long career in the diplomatic service. He's been head of internal security for three years. Baroness, Sir Roger Fenfield is a liar. <laughs> Everett Rowan frightened me. We did not have to get involved with a cook. 
get into a witch hunt filled with ugly insinuations. For most of the afternoon, we sat in the train without speaking. It began to get dark and there were rain clouds in the east. We got off at Hull and took a taxi through the gloomy October countryside. Soon we were skirting the shore of the angry looking North Sea. The house was located at Spurnhead. A tiny finger of land with the North Sea on the east and the Humber River to the west. The taxi let us off at the gate and we stood there in the twilight. Everett, Rowan, and I, looking at the huge stone house, bleak, gray, isolated. Be interesting if that house could talk, wouldn't it? Yeah, very. Will Fenfield? I am going to ask him. When? After dinner. I want to question each one of them. McLeod, Miss Ames, and Molly. And Fenfield, especially Fenfield. Uh, Mr. Rowan. Yes? I think you are a very honest man. Thank you. Along with being honest, will you try to be kind? What would you suggest? After dinner, before we start to question the others, let me have a few moments in his office with Roger. Alone? Alone. Karen, I spend 12 hours a day in this office. Can't we have coffee with the others? There are four people in this house, Roger. Philip McLeod, Jennifer Ames, Molly, and you. Routine security checks were made on all of them. I brought the files with me. Molly's records were borrowed by your office on July 16th and returned July 17th. Why is the last page of her dossier missing? Because I stole it. You... You what? Stole it. Are you surprised? I have instant access to the files on any person in England. Can you tell me why you took it? Yes, I can. I have it here in my wallet. Here. You can read it if you like. Thank you. Molly has worked in this house for 32 years. I'm determined to protect her. Now you want to question Captain McLeod and Jenny. If it's convenient, yes. Where? In the drawing room? Is that where Rowan is? Yes. You go on up. I'll send Captain McLeod up in a moment. They can come together. Send them both up. Are you nervous, Jenny? Yes. Well, don't be. I can't help it. Jenny, for heaven's sake, don't panic. They'll get into that harbor tonight, and this will be the last time we sleep in this house. Now hang on to yourself. They can ask questions until they're blue in the face. They can't know. They can't. Well, Baroness, we don't know anything more than when we started. McLeod is an ex-prisoner of war, a flyer who escaped from Germany and transferred to internal security. Miss Ames is a veritable model of demure discretion and an orphan. Molly's a dear old family retainer. We're leaked, Baroness. Yes, I am afraid we are. Unless the leak is through Roger Fenfield himself. Oh, will you stop that, please? Just the same, Baroness. I'd like to know what he's doing right now. Make five copies of that, Jenny. Yes, sir. Type them up and mail them. Then you can quit for the night. Yes, sir. And don't look so depressed, Jenny. We'll beat this thing yet. I hope so. You have seen a ghost or something? Philip, I'm frightened. I'm so frightened I can hardly stand it. For oh, heaven's sake, Jenny, control yourself. He wrote a memo. He said he'd come to the conclusion that the leak must be someone very close to him. They've 1,200 employees in London. The leak could be anywhere. Now relax. Then what are they doing here, the Baroness and Rowan? They're clever, Philip. Too clever. They're within an inch of stumbling on the whole thing. Look, Jenny. If they sink that ship tonight, our job's finished. We'll pack up and be out of here in five hours. Maybe less. What about Von Karsh? I've written the message in duplicate. One for each pigeon. They're in the capsules. The moment I hear, I'll release both birds. I'll get it. Hello? Who's calling, please? Oh, yes, sir. Just a moment. 
Mr. Churchill is on 081, sir. Churchill? Shh. Can you hear them? Yes. Keep your hand over the mouthpiece. Oh, for heaven's sake, will you shut up? Yes. They got through. They sank it. Shh. When? An hour ago. Then we leave here at night. The moment you get a chance, release those two pictures. Shh, here it comes. Captain McLeod, I'm leaving for London at once. Telephone the airfield to have my plane ready in half an hour. Is something wrong, sir? A German submarine torpedoed the Royal Oak at anchor in Scarpa Flow. <laughs> The news burst upon England in an explosion of horror and stunned disbelief. Scapa Flow was considered impregnable. Only a few top naval people knew that the submarine traps and nets on the eastern approaches had been found inadequate. Under the greatest secrecy, they had been taken up to be repaired and rebuilt. Replacements and additions had been ordered in advance. Scapa Flow had been defenseless for only 52 hours, yet it was long enough. Out of 1,200 in the crew of the battleship Royal Oak, only 400 had been saved. Sir Roger left immediately for London. Mr. Rowan went with him. I decided to stay at Spurnhead. I had an eating inward suspicion of the fear in this house. It was a fear. A fear so tangible I, I could almost smell it. Philip. I'm frightened. There they go. Why did she stay? Why? I'll take care of the Baroness, Jenny. Don't worry. You're afraid, too. Why, well, you're sweating like a steer. Take care of Molly first. Then start working on the files in his office. Pack everything you think is important. I'll release the pigeons. The messages are written in duplicate and both birds are fed. Then I'll settle with the Baroness. Are you going to... to... I'm going to kill her, Jenny. Why not bring her with us? Too dangerous. You are afraid of her. Am I? Wait and see. Stop it. Here she comes. I have never seen a man so agonized. He is positively grave with horror. Yes. It's a tragedy. Will Roger have to resign, Baroness? I am afraid he will. Uh, uh, have, you, have you lost something, Captain? Uh, my handkerchief. Oh, here it is. Are you warm? It's, it's been a bit of a shock. Yes, it has. Good night. As I was going up to my bedroom, something white pushed itself into my mind. A handkerchief. He had wiped his forehead with, with a white handkerchief, and, and when he did, my heart began to pound. I walked past my bedroom down the hall. This was a clue. It had to be. There had to be a reason why a man in Captain McLeod's position carried loose grains of wheat in his pocket. I had seen them fall to the carpet downstairs when he pulled out his handkerchief. His door was unlocked. Nobody saw me go in. I searched it thoroughly, and underneath his bed I, I found them, two of them, carrier pigeons in regulation army flight coops, the first bird hardly moved as I touched it. It was stuffed with food with wheat. To my horror, I saw on the underside of the wing next to the body the letters TK. TK. Top core. German words meaning pigeon core. I opened the capsule around the bird's leg. Inside was a message written in English. Rendezvous at agreed position, 54 degrees, 40 minutes, north latitude. Zero degrees, ten minutes east, longitude with submarine B-14. Three miles off Spurnhead, 2 a.m. this morning. McLeod. I closed the capsule quickly, replaced it around the bird's leg. Then I... I heard a noise. I crept from his room. I, I had the message in my hand. There wasn't time to examine the other pigeon. The house was in darkness. Everything was silent. Nothing moved. Slowly, I, I stole down the stairs to the telephone into the entrance hall. Number, please. Operator. There is a private landing field two miles outside Haddon. Can you connect me, please? I beg your pardon, madam. 
Papa is to listen. This is a terribly urgent call. I'm speaking from Sir Roger Fenfield's hall at Spurnhead. Yes, madam. And what number did you want? Sir Roger has a private landing field two miles outside Heddon. There is a telephone there. How would the landing field be listed, madam? I don't know how it would be listed. Just a moment, madam. <gasps> Operator. Operator. I'm sorry, madam. For security reasons, we are not allowed to give out that number. Operator, you don't understand. In a few moments, Sir Roger Fenfield is taking a plane from that field for London. He's got to be stopped. I've got to speak to him. I'm sorry, madam. Our orders are that for security reasons, that number is not to be given out under any circumstances. Operator, there's someone coming. I'm in danger. Don't you understand? Sir Roger must not catch that plane. <laughs> Dimly, I could see a figure at the head of the stairs. I felt the bullet graze my hair. I dropped the receiver to the floor and ran out the house. Then Swoods boarded the driveway. The rain beat at my face. Gasping and stumbling, I made my way through the dense forest in the direction of the highway. I knew McLeod would kill me. I knew that somehow I had to get help. I pressed myself into the shelter of an enormous oak tree and stood there, gasping, terrified. I know you're in there, Baroness. You're by the big oak tree. I know these woods very well. I don't want to kill you, but I can't spend all night chasing you. Will you come out, please? Baroness! I stumbled on. I tripped and fell. I got up. Branches tore off my clothes. I could only guess at the direction of the road. I could hear him behind me in the darkness. Cruel, relentless, calculating. For 20 minutes, we played this terrifying hide-and-seek in the wet, soaking blackness of the forest. Then almost in the front of me, I saw headlights crawling through the fog. It was the highway from Spurnhead to Hull. The rain beat at my face. I had lost one of my shoes, and <laughs> my foot was bleeding. Desperately, I stumbled down toward the road. Somewhere behind me was death. Ahead of me was a car that meant people, safety. I had to reach it. I had to. Just a few yards more. Then I heard him almost directly behind me. He crouched down, not ten feet from the road. The car drew closer. I crouched there without moving. When the car was beside me, I would jump. Jump out and scream. I took a deep breath. This scream would be heard all the way to London. <laughs> Shut up, Baroness, or you'll get it right now. Now, I'll take you home the easy way. The pilot is ready to take off. I'll be right there. Uh, yes, operator. Yes? All right, thanks. What is it? The operator says a woman with a Hungarian accent asked for this number. The operator wouldn't give it to her, said it was unlisted for security reasons. Then she said she heard a shot over the phone. A shot? That's what she said. Supposing I call the house and make sure everything's all right. Well, give me the phone. I'll call myself. All right. Spurnhead 4081, please. One moment. Hello? Jenny? What? Sir Roger, what is it? Are you all right? Why, of course. And McLeod and the Baroness? Well, the Baroness is in bed. McLeod and I are working. And everything's all right? Yes, of course. All right, Jenny. We're just taking off for London. Good night. That was Jenny. Everything's all right? The operator was hearing things. I don't believe it, Sir Roger. Oh, nonsense. Telephone operators make mistakes all the time. I mean, I don't believe you. You... You what? Go ahead and take the plane. I'm driving back to Spurnhead. Baroness, if I have to hit you again, I'll break your jaw. I'm telling you to keep quiet. You 
will never get away with it. Never. Baroness, we have gotten away with it. They'll get you his stakes forever. Jenny, smash that teletype machine. Right. In two hours, we'll be on a submarine for Germany, Baroness. And you're coming with us. There's, there's nothing left in the files. Smash the radio. We can't. Coastal Patrol would know it was out of order. Come on, let's get down to the dock. Where's the kerosene? There, in the can. Did you lock the window? Yes. Use lots of it. Well, we don't want the whole house to burn, just his papers. He won't know what we've taken and what we've left behind. Hurry, Philip, please. I'm finished. Get outside, Jenny, and keep the Baroness covered. After you, Baroness. I'm going to light a match and then make a dive for the door. Ready? Ready. That does it. You took her care of Molly? Yes. She won't come to for a week. Captain McClaws, please, I'm soaked through. Can I have a coat? Certainly, Baroness. We're going out the front way. You can take one of Rogers from the closet in the hall. I want your voyage to be comfortable. <laughs> See anything? What time is it? Ten minutes to two. You watch north, I'll watch south. Captain McLeod. Baroness, please keep quiet. I dislike hitting women. I'm telling you to shut up. Flash your light once. Too risky. There are coastal patrol ships all over the place. You're sure we're in the right position? Of course I'm sure. I've had that message written for weeks. I know it by heart. 53 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude, 0 degrees, 10 minutes east longitude. Captain McLeod, I found your pigeons. Hello, hello. I took the message out of the capsule. I left it lying on the floor inside the door of Roger Fanfield's house. Did you really? Your submarine will not be here. Tell her, Jenny. There were two pigeons, Baroness. I know that. There were two messages, both the same, one for each bird. Two... Two messages? The pigeons would be in Hull in 20 minutes, when Karsh would radio at once. So if the sub is 30 miles out, it should be here by 2 o'clock. Don't try to fool Germans, Baroness. It can't be done. Coastal Baker calling it or Charlie. Coastal Baker calling it or Charlie. Did you receive me over? Why don't they answer, Mr. Rowan? Why don't they answer? Take it easy, Molly. You've been great this far. Oh, Mr. Rowan, how could she? Jenny hit me with a gun. On the head, I... I've known that child all her life. You I... can't tell about people, Molly, ever. Are you sure they took the motorboat? Oh, yes, sir. I heard it. If I'm wrong, I'll have to leave England. Why don't they answer? The transmitter may have been damaged by the fire. It must have gotten pretty hot in this room. Into Charlie calling Coastal Baker. Are you receiving me? Come in, please. Oh, God be praised. Right, quiet. Coastal Baker calling into Charlie, receiving you loud and clear. Over. Your message received and understood. Coastal Patrol notified to watch for note about. Please repeat position. Repeat position. Position taken from small paper found in Hall of Fenfield House at Spurn Head. Repeating message. Rendezvous at agreed position, 53 degrees, 40 minutes, north latitude, 0 degrees, 10 minutes, east longitude. With submarine B-14, three miles off Spurn Head, 2 a.m. this morning. Signed, McLeod. Over. Position received and understood. North Sea Patrol ordered rise and shine. Navy interceptor proceeding this position also rise and shine. Out. Well, Molly, that's that. All we can do now is wait. What's meant by rise and shine? That means the British Navy's fighting mad. Uh, well, then I think I'll make you and I a cup of tea. For two hours, we drifted three miles off Spurnhead. The rain cut at our faces. We drift, correct position, drift again. Suddenly, a huge black shape broke through the surface of the angry sea, not 20 feet from the little boat. The submarine had reached the rendezvous. A searchlight picked us out, ringing us with a dazzling circle of brilliant light, blinding us. 
We've made it. We've made it. There's the sub. They found us. Ahoy, B-14! Why don't they answer? I... I can't see anything. The light is blinding. Ahoy, B-14! They're opening the cunning tower. Ahoy, B-14! McLeod here! Auf Forschung für Kunstzeit! Beruhigen Sie sich! Philip, what's he saying? You keep calm. We'll be safe in a minute. Auf Forschung für Kunstzeit! A rope. He's, he's throwing us a rope. Our fasten them down. Ready for rope. Got it. Keep still, Baroness. We want you alive. Oh, no, you don't. Let me go. Let me go. I'll drown before I'll get on the German submarine. Give me a hand, B-14. I... Beruhigen Sie sich, Captain McLeod. His Majesty's submarine R-27 has a 50-millimeter cannon trained right smack on your boat. Please don't make us use it. We've just cleaned the gun. <laughs> Right up until the last minute, I thought it was a German submarine. The Navy can work fast when it has to. Uh, did McLeod confess, Sir Roger? Yes. And the real Captain McLeod is still in a concentration camp in Germany. Or dead? We don't know. This imposter took his papers, his credentials, identification, everything. <laughs> for over a year, a German speaking perfect English has been working for internal security. The real McLeod grew up in India. Nobody in England knew him. That's how the impersonation was possible. Well, how about the girl? When she realized the submarine was British, she jumped into the water. She drowned almost immediately. Baroness, it was mighty smart of you to drop that message right at the door. I wonder if the other pigeon got through. It did. The German sub reached the rendezvous and was sunk by the boat that rescued Karen. Well, I have one more question. What about that last page in Molly's dossier? Molly is a wonderful woman. When she was 20, she got into trouble with a man who loved her very much but who couldn't marry her. Why couldn't he? Because Molly wouldn't have him. She refused him a dozen times. You see, Mr. Rowan, Jennifer Ames was Molly's daughter. I suspected she was. The girl never knew that Molly was her mother. She was sent to the best schools, and I kept her here as my secretary to give Molly happiness. The last page of the dossier, which I took the liberty of confiscating, listed Jennifer Ames as Molly's child. Will she never marry this man? No. She keeps insisting that he has a great career, that she is just a cook. Roger, I have a feeling Molly would marry you now. Why don't you ask her once more? Just heard Ilona Massey as the Baroness Karen Gazer in another transcribed story of intrigue and espionage brought to you by NBC. Here is Miss Massey to tell you about next week's show. Next week, a story of a church that sheltered evil. A trip to Brussels and an escape. A top secret story called The Church Without a Cross. <laughs> Top Secret is written, directed, and produced by Harry W. Junkin. Heard in support of Miss Massey tonight were Louis Van Ruten, Alfred Shirley, David McKay, Brooke Byron, and Bryna Rayburn. The music was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shield. This is Fred Collins speaking. Take It or Leave It provides gay entertainment for you next on NBC.